Well, let's try it again. Let's give it another shot. This morning we will talk about the right of royalty. We take our text this morning from the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 28 through 38. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 38. Where the Bible says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, tell him, The Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus through their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came to the place near the mount, and he came to the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. In verse 28, we see that the Bible says that Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He was ready to make a grand entry in the form of a grand processional, a glorious parade. Most of us love a parade, from the Rose Bowl parade to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade. That's the second thing I do on Thanksgiving morning. The first thing I do, of course, is brew a cup of coffee. No, it would be the third thing. Brew the coffee, cut the pie, watch the parade in that order. I love the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We love them. We love local homecoming parades. Folks love and enjoy them because they're fun and they're festive from the floats to the marching bands to the parade royalty perched very visibly upon a fine-looking, usually expensive automobile, one that's fitting, one that's appropriate to parade of royalty. An old jalopy in this case and in this instance, just wouldn't work. That's not how parade royalty rides. That's not how royalty rides, for that matter. Queen Elizabeth doesn't bump about in an old jalopy. When she conducts her business, Queen Elizabeth rides in a Bentley State limousine. That just might do the trick. There were two of them built for her in 2002 at a cost of $12.2 million apiece. Now, that's a car. They're big. They're powerful, they're beautiful, and equipped with every possible amenity. Not only are they sleek in their appearance, but they are safe. They're armored, and the cabin can be sealed in case of a gas attack. They're blast resistance. The tires are reinforced with Kevlar. I don't know about you, but my conclusion is that's a car. And it's a car that's used for official engagements. It's a car that she uses. This is kind of interesting. She uses for church on Sundays while at Balmoral at Sandringham. She pulls up, and folks must think, now this, this Bentley State limousine, now that's a ride of royalty. That's how Queen Elizabeth rolls. It's an image. It's an expression of majesty. It's an image, an expression of glory. In this parade, in this processional that we see here in the Gospel of Luke. We ask the question, perhaps, and maybe the people were thinking, what in the world is Jesus going to ride in this grand parade, this great processional? Maybe he'll commandeer a chariot. Maybe he'll ride a big, strong, handsome steed. Maybe he and his disciples will create a makeshift royal coach. But we see none of that in the text. No, in this, in this parade, the ride of royalty was, of all things, a donkey, a young donkey. Reminds me a little bit of Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. And here we have in the passage, in the narrative, divinity on a donkey. Now, what kind of image did that project? What kind of image does it project to us? What did the people think? What do we think when we see our king on a donkey? 
What did they want to see? A king on a donkey or a strong stallion, a mighty war horse? What are we to make of this ride of royalty? Well, there are three things. But first of all, we must acknowledge that this young donkey was the preferred mode of transportation for the royal one. Jesus preferred it, and Jesus picked it. Jesus chose the animal. It was his by virtue of personal selection. We see that in verses 29 and 30. And so it, 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 it begs several questions, at least in my mind. I see Jesus on a donkey, and I don't know about you, and, and this kind of gets me in trouble because I just plunge headlong into a series of, of questions. I told everybody gathered here this morning, by everybody, I'm not talking about a whole mass of people. I'm talking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, including myself. And then we have those faces in the sound booth that nobody ever sees, but this doesn't happen without them back there. I said, but by the end of the first point, you're probably going to be so bored out of your skull that you're going to check out and just drop the whole thing. But we're going to go for it because this is what I've got. So the question is, why in the world did Jesus select a donkey for his ride? Why not, as we've suggested, a horse? Surely a horse would have been a better choice for a, a conquering king, for uh, an animal that might have conveyed the image of might and the image of power. And that's exactly what many in Jesus' day wanted and expected. They wanted a proud and they wanted a powerful general, a militaristic Messiah, bent on ousting the Romans and freeing the nation of Israel from Roman rule. That's what they wanted. And they wanted uh, a mighty figure on a strong mount to send a, to send a message and to convey a message to the Romans that, that this king of Israel meant business. Well, that's what we want too, right? He came on a donkey the first time, and yet we look forward to the one who will come back on the white horse to defeat his and to defeat our enemies. We look forward to that day, and one day, the Bible says, he will come on that great white horse, our conquering hero, our conquering king, but this time, he comes on a donkey, in spite of what the people wanted. In spite of the conventional wisdom that existed among the people in that day, he didn't come on a horse, he came on a donkey. Secondly, to our surprise, perhaps, it was not considered to be beneath the dignity of Israel's noblemen or kings to ride a mule or a donkey. Absalom, for example, rode on a donkey. Mephibosheth, I was really worrying about that word, about that name. It's an M word. And M words are problematic words for me. I usually stumble and stutter over those. But not today. Mephibosheth, I did it twice. Saul's grandson. Royalty rode on a donkey. Solomon, when he was affirmed as the king of Israel, he rode on David's, on David's mule. 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 32 through 40. I think there's a third reason why. Jesus picked a donkey for his ride, and it, and it is this. A donkey was a symbol of peace, and in this case, a symbol of power from another place. How often did we hear Jesus, Jesus say the words, my kingdom is not of this world. It was from another place. It was from heaven. And Jesus, as he mounts this donkey, seems to be saying, my peace will beat, will trump your power. And so he willingly and gladly and preferably ascends to the back of the donkey in just a few moments. Fourthly, what kind of donkey did he select? Well, the text has told us he selected a donkey unbroken, a donkey untamed, a donkey unused, a donkey unridden, one that was fit, one that was suitable, one that was appropriate for sacred purpose. Stop and think about it for a second. I don't know how many donkeys would have been in Jerusalem or just outside of Jerusalem that particular day. Maybe there were a few, maybe there were many, but you have to think that there was more than one. But Jesus sets his mind, his heart, and his affections on one particular donkey. And this donkey, at least to my way of thinking, had been created for this very moment and this very reason to bear on his back, to be the ride for the sinless son of God. Jesus picked a perfect donkey 
And he did so because he was and is the perfect Savior. But number five, how was this donkey selected? Was he selected according to prior arrangement? Had there been a negotiation? Had there been a deal cut with Jesus or his followers previous to this narrative taking place, weeks before, days before, months before, had they said to this individual, look, this thing's going to be coming down soon. And when it does, we're going to need a donkey. He's going to need a ride to go into Jerusalem. So tell you what, we'll come by, we'll give you a password, a code word, the Lord needs it, and then when we're ready for it, we'll utter the word and hopefully you'll let him go into our care. And maybe they would have said, well, well and fine, we could use the money. He is up for rent, but what kind of price are y'all willing to pay? And the back and forth would ensue, and then they would agree upon a price, and the deal was done. The deal was cut according to prior negotiation. And Jesus and his disciples strike a deal with this guy. Uh, a, a lot of commentators seem to think that that's what happened. This agreement was come to as the result of prior arrangement. But I don't, I don't believe it. I don't buy it. I think the donkey was selected not according to prior arrangement, but according to supernatural arrangement. I happen to believe that there was no previous understanding between, between Jesus and the owners, as it says in verse 33, the owners of the cult. I believe it was by virtue of sovereign and supernatural sight that Jesus saw and Jesus selected this little cult. It seems only right. I mean, why is Jesus being, and why would Jesus be praised by the masses as he rolls in and rides into town? The text tells us that he would be praised by the masses because of the mighty and many miracles that he had done. If he's done mighty and many miracles for which the people are praising him, why in the world couldn't he do one more? And I think he did. I think by sovereign sight and supernatural understanding, Jesus picked this little untamed, unridden, and unused donkey. And for Jesus, this will be the right of royalty, this donkey. And it is by virtue of personal selection. That's the first thing I see in the text that we just read a moment ago. The second thing I see is prompt submission, verses 31 through 34. They go to the owners. We need this little donkey, and so they begin to untie it. And the owners say, what in the world are you doing? And they simply say, hey, listen, the Lord, the Lord needs it. Now, the disciples knew him as Lord. And they were willing to give quick obedience to any request that the Lord made of them. Almost any. Sometimes you see them struggling just like we struggle. Sometimes you see them fumbling over just exactly what it was that the Lord Jesus Christ meant as he spoke words to them. They had their moments of difficulty. They had their lapses. But usually in response to the Lord, they would quickly obey. We don't know who this individual was. We don't know where he stood before the Lord, but obviously and clearly he was in fairly good standing in terms of his understanding of the person of Jesus Christ. Everybody had heard of him. They had heard of the mighty and marvelous things that he had done, the feeding of the multiple thousands, raising the dead, giving sight to blind men, creating hearing what there was none, raising people like Lazarus, from the dead. The disciples saw him as Lord, and evidently this fella, this individual, these owners of the donkeys did as well. We cannot assume that the disciples were the only followers of our Lord Jesus Christ in these days. There had to be, there must have been others that we don't know anything about. These owners must have been followers to some degree and extent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when the order is given, they obey. Quick obedience to the request of the Lord. The Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. There's no argument on the part of the owners as to the understanding of the identity of Jesus. Now, what are you talking about? The Lord, the, 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 the Lord needs it? Who in the world is the Lord? You, you mean the Messiah? Where is he? 
What evidence is there that he is anywhere to be found in close proximity to me, to us, to me, to my donkey? Oh, we don't know anything about the Lord. He doesn't quarrel with them at that point. They do not remonstrate with the request. They just simply, quickly, and surely obey. There's no quarrel. There's no quibble, although it was a significant one because to own a donkey was a luxury. Most people were too poor to be able to afford a donkey. It's not like in our society. Back when I was growing up, most people had one car. You know, when we got our second car, that was a really, really, really big deal. And now most people have multiples. They have cars for work. They have cars for recreation. They have automobiles for pleasure. You know, put the top down, turn the stereo on, put on the sunglasses, Angela, and off, off, <laughs> off, off you go. Wasn't the case in the first century. Not everybody owned a donkey. Couldn't afford to buy it. Couldn't afford to feed it and maintain it. Sometimes, maybe like in this context where the Bible refers to the owners of the donkey in verse 33, a group of people might pool their funds to obtain one to share. And if you had one, you just weren't going to lend it to anybody, not to anyone. But you would perhaps, in this culture, you would provide your donkey as a ride for royalty if royalty made the request a significant person. If they asked, you might say, it, 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 was, it, it was endemic to the culture, you might say, yes, royal one, you're welcome to use my donkey. They see him as the Lord. They see him as a blessed royal. Royalty requested, and the reply was an immediate yes. The owners, the followers willingly and gladly gave them their donkey, this ride of royalty. And you had to believe that once he mounted the back of this humble animal that they were so very proud. Boy, there he goes. The Lord, the Messiah, the miracle man. Whose donkey is that? That's our donkey. And boy, that donkey's never looked better. And that donkey will never, ever serve such a high and holy purpose as this. Let me ask you a question. Are we as quickly obedient? Do we stand as ready as these humble owners of that donkey to say, Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. Are we willing to give it up and to give it over, whatever it may be? Something valuable? Something personal? Something great? Something profound? Something significant? No, the lesson these guys teach us is this. If we confess him as Lord, then we must live as if he is Lord. And we must say, Lord, whatever I have in my hand, my hand is open and I gladly give it to you. Whatever I cherish in my heart, Lord, it's yours. Whatever I value between the years, whatever I ponder, consider, and think of, and draw the conclusion, this is important and significant to me, Lord. I'm going to give it. I'm going to lay it on the altar of sacrifice. Should you ask, I will trust you. I will obey. Are we as submissive as the owners of this donkey? How about this one? Are we as submissive as the donkey? You, you have to keep in mind that the donkey was untamed and had never been ridden. If anybody else had climbed on his back, what do you think the donkey would have done? The donkey would have protested, right? The donkey would have expressed his opinion by saying, what are you doing on my back? And he would have kicked and he would have bucked. But under the weight of this sacred load, he is... Submissive, because it's the Lord riding to town on the donkey. And we might be more inclined to be submissive and to be yielded and to be given to the Lord in every respect, to every possible degree, if we viewed him, if we understood him to be the Lord. But that's the rub. We call him that. 
but we don't conform our lives oftentimes to that reality. We pick and we choose obedience. We pick and we choose that which we want to submit to, but not this guy. The Lord asked for the greatest possession the guys possessed, and he turns it over to them without quarrel, without quibble, and without question. Why? Because they knew him to be the Lord, and because they did, they offered prompt submission. But thirdly, 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 we see public significance. Jesus just didn't pick the donkey and mount the donkey because he thought it would be cute or because it would, he thought it would, be, it would be cool. His being on a donkey was incredibly and profoundly symbolic and significant. And so the question is, what was the significance of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on this young donkey? Three things. First, Jesus came to Jerusalem on a donkey, number one, to fulfill God's promise. Now, Luke doesn't mention this in his gospel, this promise of which we speak and that I mentioned here uh, this morning. But Matthew does in chapter 21, verse 4. And according to Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ mounted the donkey, moved along on the donkey, entered the city on the donkey as a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Those words of Zechariah were prophesied. They were spoken 550 years before this particular event. Zechariah, under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, said, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. God promised 550 years before the event as we see it in Luke chapter 19. And we see him fulfilling it in this very way, in this very instance, at this very, at this particular point and place in time. God speaks and God promises. And what does God do? God keeps his promises. Every single one of them. Down to the most specific detail, God keeps his promises. We make promises and we fudge on the promises. We make promises and we fulfill them partially. We make promises and we try to figure out ways to wiggle out of them. But God makes promises, and when he does, he stands by them because it is, it is impossible, it says in the book of Hebrews, for God to lie. So God makes promises, and then God is good to his word. Whatever his promises might be. Redemptive promises made through Jesus Christ to be realized fully and completely by the people of God in every particular and in every possible way. Yes, and absolutely, you ask, where do I find the promises? We find them in the Bible, some big, some small, but all taken seriously by God. So we find promises, prophecy fascinating, don't we? Some of you Bible students are sitting out there, some of you people that are concerned about Bible knowledge, and you're thinking, wow, 550 years. And by the way, this is one of the ways that the veracity, the truthfulness, the integrity of the Bible is established and substantiated. His own predicted prophecy coming to pass. God makes promises 550 years before the event. The event happens just like God said it would. Now that's an amazing thing and that's an overwhelming thing. And we think intellectually, boy, that does it for me. That nails it down for me. Whatsoever God says is absolutely true. The Bible then and therefore is infallible, is an errant, it is a good thing, and my mind and my intellectual curiosity is satisfied. That's one way the promises of God and the prophecies, the fulfillment of them, minister to us. But there are other promises of God that don't necessarily have their roots in predictive promise, uh, prophecy. There's the promise of God to secure us. The promise of God to settle us. The promise of God to be near us and to be with us. The promise of God to give us peace. To know that every breath of life, because it's lived 
under the purview of the sovereignty of God is, is, is replete with meaning and, and purpose. And we could go on and on and on. And I don't know about you, but for me, in these days, that reality and that fact that God keeps his promises is very, very important to me. It's one of the things that settles me and secures me and renders me strong when everything seems to be turned upside down. Why did Jesus come to Jerusalem riding on a donkey to fulfill God's promise? And if he will fulfill that one, then he will fulfill each and every one of them. And if you want to know what they are more specifically and more clearly, then you go to the Bible and I will promise you, beyond any doubt, you will find multiple and many promises there that are intended to encourage and bless and strengthen the heart of the believer. Why did he come to town or riding on a donkey? Well, he did secondly to affirm his identity. Who would come to town riding on a donkey? The Bible says your king would come to town riding on a donkey. And they responded to that reality that they had heard for the millennia, for a long, long time. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That was a messianic statement. We find that statement in many Hillel songs that were sung by the people of God during the Passover. And they looked forward to that. They anticipated that, the coming of the king who would come in the name of the Lord. John refers to Jesus as the king of Israel. Paul refers to Jesus in 1 Timothy as the king eternal, the king of kings, and Lord of lords. Pilate would affirm his identity by asking him the question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus would respond and say, you know what? You got it, man. You got it. You say so. And you'll get no argument from me. Yes, I am. The notice at the top of the cross said, this is the king of the Jews. Reminds me of a song that we used to sing back in the in the cheesy 80s, <laughs> Gary McSpadden, he is the king, and he will reign forever. He is the king, and we will praise his name, the king of kings and lord of lords forever. Jesus, he is the king, and he is king Jesus, and he rules his Kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom. He's the possessor of a kingdom. He is the king of that kingdom. And we are, if we know him by faith, if we know him through trust, we are gladly and thankfully his subjects, aren't we? To whom do we yield? Whom do we obey? To whom do we submit? To whom do we devote our every breath? We devote are all to King Jesus, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His kingdom has come, and we who know him are a part of it. And we who know him look forward to that day when the kingdom will come. And there will be no more flailing about like we see today. No more fear, no more panic. The old earth will be destroyed and there will come a new Jerusalem from the sky. And it will initiate and inaugurate a new heaven and a new earth and the Lamb of God will be the light of that place. We look forward to that day, but until that day, we live our lives in light of the fact that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the King. Thirdly, there's another reason he rides on a donkey. By riding in on a donkey, this ride of royalty would indicate that he came to bring his peace. Verse 38 says, peace in heaven and glory in the, in the highest. The prince of peace of Isaiah has come, so says Jesus as he rides on this donkey. What Micah promises in Micah chapter 5 Verse 5 has come true. There Jesus, there the word of God promises that the Messiah would be our peace, the substance of our peace, the source of our peace. His birth declared his peace. Glory to God in the highest 
and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And here shortly before his death, he demonstrates as he rides into Jerusalem on this donkey the fact that he is the presence of peace. The people would have seen it, and if they were thinking rightly, scripturally and correctly, they would have concluded, God is now at peace with his people Israel, and we now can be at peace with him. If they were thinking right, if they were thinking scripturally, but this is what he brings to us. I mean, what are we to make of it? In relationship and in regard to the peace that he was ushering in and bringing, what are we to make of it? Well, this is what he brings to us as we mentally envision him riding on. I mean, how can you think of such things without seeing him in your mind's eye riding into town on a donkey? He wasn't just bringing the people of Jerusalem peace. He wasn't just bringing the nation of Israel peace. He was bringing peace to both Jew and Gentile. And on this Palm Sunday, we happen to believe that this same Jesus Christ brings the very same to us. The peace wasn't had through the donkey. The peace was had and to be had by the person on the donkey. And so this morning, we draw this conclusion. This Jesus riding on the donkey who brought peace to Jerusalem brings peace to us. We, through him, says the Bible, can have peace with God. Romans 5, 1, we have, Paul says, peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is, there is no one else who has broken down the wall of partition, the dividing wall that stood between us and a holy and righteous God. Jesus came and he lived for us. He loved us and he laid down his life that that wall might come down, that the veil might be torn, and that folks who place their faith and trust in him might be able to come into the very presence of God personally and willfully in faith and trust and receive from God so great and so glory, glorious and so gracious a salvation. Forgiveness of sins. Clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the divine one. And may I say that this can come no other way. We are saved by no other means. We are redeemed by no other person except the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by him, the bearer of peace, that we find peace with God. It is by him and through him. And through him only that we can have peace within. Jesus comes to Jerusalem on a donkey. And in that very image, we conclude we can have peace with God through this man. We can have peace within through this man. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Paul amplifies and he says, if you will pray in a spirit of thanksgiving that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And boy, don't we need that today. We've talked about it, we've talked about it, we've harped on it, but goodness gracious, I don't know that we can talk about it enough, right? A lot of people fearful and fretful these days. But we need not be. Because if we have peace with God, we will have the peace of God within. So the question is, do you have peace today? The Jews didn't. They didn't. Because they rejected Jesus, and according to verse 42 of chapter 19, they rejected the peace that came from him. Do you want it? I know you need it. And I can say beyond any doubt that you will find it. Yes, it can be found. But only in the one who came to town, riding on that symbol of peace, a little donkey, the ride of royalty who bore divinity that we might have peace and know the peace of God that passes all understanding. Well, all this is because of personal selection. Jesus picked the donkey. We see in the text prompt submission. I pray that in these days we would yield our lives completely and absolutely quickly and surely to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then we see the reasons why. To fulfill predictive prophecy. To establish his identity as king over all. And to give us a peace with God and within. That we so desperately, desperately need. May we pray together. Holy and Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you would bless this word to our hearts and to our understanding. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would make these things about which we have spoken incredibly clear in our minds and hearts. And if there is some way that we as believers need to respond, perhaps in regard to greater and more prompt submission, I pray we do it. And perhaps, Father, there's somebody out there that has heard the message this morning and would say that like the Jews... They've rejected Christ to this point, but Lord, perhaps they're under the impression that today, as their hearts have been warmed, they feel strangely drawn to him. And instead of rejecting, they need and feel compelled to receive him. And I pray that they would do that simply by saying, Lord Jesus Christ, forgive me a sinner. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Even today, my, I embrace and take to my heart the blessed Prince of peace. We ask, Lord, that as your word has gone forth, that it would not return void, but would accomplish the very purpose for which it is sent. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.